and uh, welcome to this MHPN webinar tonight on prostate cancer, the effects on mental health after surgery. Um, welcome to all of you from all over Australia, over 300 people online at the moment. Um, and also we'd like to welcome the people who are going to watch this on the podcast later, which is often quite a number of people. MHPN wishes to acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and facilitators and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the elders, past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. My name's Mary Emilaeus and I will be facilitating tonight's session. Um, I have a background in general practice and psychotherapy, so I have a particular interest in um, the whole person and the, how the, the, the mind and body are connected. I have um, not particularly worked with prostate cancer, but I've done a lot of MHPN webinars and I'm really pleased to be facilitating this tonight. I'm actually also now training as a psychiatrist, so I can possibly represent that discipline a tiny bit. Um, and I would really like to welcome our presenters tonight. So um, I'll start with Jane. Now before I do, I just wanted to acknowledge that we do have a, a mostly female panel um, and most of us don't possess a prostate gland, but um, MHPN has worked really hard to try and find pr practitioners from different disciplines who have expertise in this area. Um, so we, we acknowledge that it's perhaps a little bit unusual. Um, Jane, I'd like to welcome you and I am curious to find out how you got a um, special interest in prostate cancer as a female GP. Yeah, well I work in uh, suburban Melbourne but um, I was asked to look after men with advanced prostate cancer who are on androgen deprivation therapy or hormone therapy and this sort of treatment has uh, got loads of side effects, um, medical and uh, psychological and uh, often the specialist would start a patient on this treatment, they'd think well the GP will look after the, the, uh, the patients and the GP would think well the urologist or, or radiation oncologist will look after it. And so these men were falling through the gaps. And uh, so my job was to come and bridge the gap and monitor and uh, manage these men. Well, it's great to have you on our panel. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and Declan, so you are a specialist urologist, uh, originally from Ireland and now living in Melbourne. Um, I wonder if you have a, an opinion, this may be putting you on the spot, but what do you think is sort of the biggest issue um, facing you know, the health professions in regard to prostate cancer at the moment. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank, thank you, of course, for the uh, invitation to participate in this uh, fantastic event. Well, I'll, it's, it's an enormous topic, but I'll summarize it very briefly that for me, uh, the greatest challenge uh, in, in managing prostate cancer in Australia today is balancing the, the benefits of early detection, diagnosing men early, et cetera, um, along with the, uh, the, the proven harms, as we'll discuss uh, this evening, uh, in, uh, in, in administering treatment for men. So balancing uh, benefits of early detection, better survival, etc., uh, along with uh, the, the inevitable side effects of treatment, uh, uh, that's the biggest challenge. Okay, and I'm sure, as you say, we will come back to that. So thanks very much for that and welcome to the panel. And um, Samantha, I'd like to welcome you. So you're a psychologist with a special interest in this area and I understand that you've um, been trialling a lot of, or have experienced using a lot of mindfulness interventions um, in, for people affected by prostate cancer. It, and have you found that to be helpful? Well, certainly anyone diagnosed with cancer finds that their head is always harking back to the past or is sort of sort of thinking about the future possible consequences. So any intervention is going to help people to feel um, more able to know where their head is and to get it back into the present moment is going to be a useful thing. But mindfulness isn't for, certainly the intensive mindfulness interventions are not for every man. Um, but for men who are really keen to, to learn that as a skill, it can be very useful. And Samantha, you're, um, Jane's in rural Victoria and Declan's in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Where about to you? Yeah. I'm in Brisbane. Great, another Queenslander. Absolutely, and, yeah. And welcome to everybody from all over the place. That's one of the great things about this platform. Now just coming back to the platform, just for the audience information, um, 
there is a chat box down in the bottom of your screen. You can see a tab that says general chat. Um, and I'll just move on to some guidelines around using that in a moment, but you'll see that. In the bottom right hand corner, there's a little file icon and that contains resources that relate to this webinar. Uh, and we will be discussing that a, a bit later on. Uh, there is a technical help tab if you have any problems um, that you can have a look at and see if you can solve them or ask for help. So there is a number that you can call in the technical help box if you're still having difficulty. Um, we will be really encouraging your feedback at the end of the webinar and um, there will be a tab that gives you access to a survey at the end. So we now have 430 people online. Welcome to everybody. Uh, now just to make sure that everyone gets the most out of this live webinar, um, we just want you to be aware that it is um, as though you were in a face-to-face -face activity. So things that you write in the chat box can be seen by the participants and panellists and just keep it um, you know, on topic. Uh, and if you have any technical questions, put them into the technical box because they may not be noticed if they're in the participant chat box. Uh, and that's the phone number there if you need any help and it will be repeated into the um, technical help box. So just to have a quick look at the learning outcomes. Um, so by the end of the webinar, we hope that you will be able to identify some challenges, tips and strategies for building appropriate referral pathways and implementing a collaborative response to help men with mental health difficulties after surgery for prostate cancer, um, to identify the key principles of providing appropriate therapies and communication approaches for men with these uh, challenges and also their families and carers, and describe the general principles of providing a safe and supportive environment for men experiencing mental health concerns after surgery for prostate cancer. The way in which the webinar will proceed, for those of you who are new to this platform, is that each of our panellists is going to give a response to the case study uh, and then we'll be facilitating a discussion between the panellists. You are very welcome to submit any questions or things you'd like addressed into the general chat box and um, we will do our best to incorporate that into the discussion. I've also um, been provided with all the questions that you submitted on your registration. So we can't ever cover everything but we'll do our best um, now, all of you have been sent the case study in advance and um, I suppose the thing that struck me about it was it's just such a human story and um, I think all of us can imagine ourselves in one or other or perhaps as the pr practitioner or any of the people in this story and it's, it's a very real story. So I would like uh, first of all to invite Jane to come and give her response to how she would uh, think about Peter if he was to be her patient as a GP. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. So to summarise, Peter has prostate cancer and is not coping very well. So my first slide is basically looking at the general aspects of general, general practice care and how that relates to a patient with a cancer diagnosis and then how it relates to Peter. So the first thing is to establish a rapport so that he sees the GP as a first port of call. He can be confident to come and see the GP for any medical or psychological issues. Um, the second one is try and, and try and keep involved in his care as, as part of his treatment team. Um, regularly review him and ask him about uh, side effects of his cancer and the management he's having and try and help manage him through that. Uh, the other thing is reassurance and try and put his cancer into perspective. Of course, Cancer diagnosis is a very challenging, worrying diagnosis for most people. Um, so find out what the fears. They might, as soon as you say it, might be death or chemo or not working or family issues. And uh, so find out about their fears. Try and put it into perspective, um, and uh, and give him hope. You know, he, a lot of people with cancer can still, uh, you know, still do work, still have good quality of life, and can get through this with help and support. Um, the other really important part for GP is to coordinate his care and help him navigate the, the healthcare system, especially with the use of the EPC items so that uh, the, so Peter can access Medicare rebatable uh, psychology, um, psychological counselling or referrals for allied health sessions too. Um, and the other thing is to manage the rest of Peter's health. I mean, this is 
blood pressure okay, is he smoking, try and look at his lifestyle factors, get him exercising, have a healthy diet. So just look at the holistic uh, side of that. Um, so in Peter's case, I've actually divided him into three stages. And the first one is stage one, where he has an elevated PSA, but there's no diagnosis at this stage. Um, and he's very anxious about this, um, about what this means. And so this results in him delaying his treatment. Um, and, his, and, and Anne, his wife, is quite frustrated and they're starting to argue. So what's the role of the GP? Uh, the role of the GP is at the outset when, you, when you're talking and counselling a man about PSA testing is to put it into perspective. Let him know that there are lots, PSA can be high for many reasons, not just cancer. If it is high, we do repeat it with six weeks to three months. And if it still remains elevated, then we would routinely send him on to a urologist for sorting it out. Um, so try and set the scene that if it is high and it stays high, it does not mean cancer. It might be it needs sorting out um, so that uh, hopefully it doesn't freak out on it after that first test. Um, the other thing is to manage his expectations, educate him about, well, if he, if, if the PSA is elevated, and we do, I do refer Peter to to Declan, uh, what might happen, maybe an MRI or what a biopsy entails, and what happens if, if cancer is found in that biopsy, and, uh, and explain there may be very high grade ones or very low grade ones, many don't need treatment, but whatever the outcome is, there's lots of treatments, lots of hope, lots of help available to him. Um, so reassurance and perspective. So the, I mean, he's seeing elevated PSA and plus prostate cancer does not mean you're dying. There's plenty of, of good quality of life ahead if cancer is diagnosed. Keep reassuring him. Um, but at this stage, I'm I'm a little bit concerned about his level of distress already uh, before the diagnosis, and um, you know, I wonder if I think he will need a psychologist at some stage. He may not accept it at this stage. So the second, oh sorry, and there was also, because he was ignoring the, the reminders for his PSA, um, I'd just be ringing him up and trying to contact him and, and talk to him and say, look, what's going on, and, uh, and try and reassure him and, and keep him uh, in the therapeutic loop. So for stage two, at this stage, uh, Peter has high-grade prostate cancer diagnosed, and he will, is about to undertake a radical robotic prostatectomy. And from the GP side, of, uh, side often, we're not part of the, the picture for Peter at this stage. He's often very busy uh, with admission and surgery and recovery and nurses and catheters. And, and so the GP uh, is kind of a bit too busy, not much energy for us. But, but uh, if, if you could always ask if he wants to come in at any stage. But I often just ring, the, ring him up uh, just to see how's, how's he going. Um, just keep engaged in his care. Um, what are his expectations? I mean, how long will he be in hospital? Um, and what have been told about continence and erectile function recovery and how much time off work? Um, and is he having his physiotherapy of his continence and does he know about penile rehabilitation? And just how is the other things in his life? How's his family? What's happening with work? You know, has he, is he um, is he losing much money through all this? Is he okay? Um, and has he been offered a referral to a psychologist if, uh, if, uh, if he needs it? But I know some uh, specialists in town do often uh, get psychology in at this stage, just because of the impact it has on the patient and the partner. So the main aim is to manage expectations and ensure or encourage allied health input at this stage. So then there's stage three, which is the recovery and survivorship side. I mean, um, he has, uh, Peter has had his prostate uh, removed and his PSA is now undetectable, which is a good outcome for him. But he's, he's depressed, he has existential issues, he has significant bladder and erectile issues intimacy and relationship problems, and, and Anne is highly distressed. So he's got the, a full hand of, uh, of side effects. Um, so Peter and Anne need help, and this requires a multidisciplinary team care approach. And part of the GP is to navigate which, which allied health or which person would you refer to first, so when are they ready to see one to the other. So navigating through this. But the, the options are, first of all, psychology, um, for Peter and Anne, and as a couple, to try and um, uh, work through the distress and the relationship and the intimacy issues. Um, he has erectile dysfunction, um, and so this might mean medication, or there's treatments with different devices or injections, and often psychologists and, and sexual counsellors might be required. Um, then there's the continence management, which may involve a physiotherapist, 
um, but continent service medications or refer back to um, Declan, the urologist. Um, and exercise prescription. Um, exercise physiologist is they're fantastic to help. These can help with mood. Uh, it's been shown to have better cancer outcomes, um, can improve sexual dysfunction and overall health. Um, so the GP for this stage is to review and facilitate and manage the mood, relationships, sexual and continence issues and to coordinate the care. Um, the other thing is to clarify the post-cancer treatment surveillance protocol and uh, ensure adherence <laughs> via recall and reminder systems. Keep encouraging, have your PSA, go back and see Declan, that sort of thing. Um, and also just be there and maintain hope. That's it. Thanks very much for that, Jane. Um, I just wanted to clarify before we go on, what does EPC stand for? That was on one of your slides. Oh, uh, enhanced uh, primary care uh, program. So there, there are Medicare items available to the government where a patient can access a rebate uh, with the allied health. They can access five sessions per year and access a Medicare rebate for those five sessions with a, um, an allied health, for example, a physiotherapist, exercise physiologist. And the GP mental health care plan where a patient can access up to 10 sessions a year with a psychologist and receive um, a Medicare rebate. Thank you. Yeah, um, most of our audience would be familiar with the mental health item numbers, but maybe not have been aware of the EPC. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very much for that. And I guess I just wanted to comment that in many of the people who are in rural and regional areas, there may not be a psychologist available, but there may be other um, counselling professionals who are well equipped to be the referral person for Peter as well. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, and. Thank you, Jane. And I'd like to move on to Declan. And I have a technical question for you, Declan. So, um, Julie, Jane was speaking about um, robotic prostatectomy. So, could you just briefly explain what the robotic bit means? Because we've got a lot of mental health professionals who may not understand what's what's the difference between, you know, what what's the difference between robotic and open prostatectomy, that sort of thing. I know that may not have been on your agenda, but just to clarify that. It's a common question, Mary. I'm very happy to uh, dispel the myth that um, when we describe robotic prostatectomy, there's some sort of machine, you know, uh, running around the operating theater uh, like something out of Terminator. Um, so it's not quite so elaborate. It, in fact, it, uh, the, the term robotic is a little bit of a misnomer uh, because it, there is not a machine autonomously doing surgery. It's more of a, a robot assistant uh, uh, approach. Uh, briefly, it's just a form of keyhole or laparoscopic surgery. So instead of making a, a big cut in the tummy to, to go and take the prostate out, um, it's in a very difficult location down behind the, the pubic bone. We instead put small holes into the abdomen and through those holes we put in a, a telescope, a 3D telescope, which gives us an amazing view inside the body. And then we attach some robotic surgery arms uh, to the patient, which allow us to put tiny telescopes about the size of my finger uh, and instruments the same size deep down into the pelvis um, to do the surgery. So we get a great view, an amazing view, and we get beautiful instruments that we, we, we can't normally use uh, and to do, to do the prostatectomy to take out the prostate. Um, so it's still a big operation, removing the prostate and, and joining everything together. But nowadays, by using a robot approach, that's the way the majority uh, of prostatectomies are done around uh, Meldrum, certainly. Um, it allows patients to go home the next day. So the, the three I did yesterday went home this morning. The two I did today will go home uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, and patients get back to work uh, really, really quite quickly. So that it's quite delicate. It allows a really delicate surgical procedure and also the, a much smaller cut in their tummy so they get better much quicker. Is that basically it? Yes, that's right. But uh, that's not to overstate the impact of a prostatectomy, as, you, as you've just yeah. heard already in this case. So. It's still a, a big job. At the end of the day, what's happening is the, the prostate is being disconnected from the urinary tract and from the, the rectum and from the nerves and so on and being joined back together. So that's the same whether you do it with a keyhole robot surgery or an old-fashioned cut. But there are some definite, at least short-term advantages, uh, as, as we've mentioned, going home quickly, very little blood loss. But the, the really big thing, the, uh, the cancer results, the, uh, the return of continence, the return of sexual function, it's not really clear at all if, if doing it with the robot is any better than 
than a, a very experienced open surgeon making a, a cut. And, and I, I think that's important. It, it really comes down to the, the experience and skill of, of the surgeon uh, and how many cases he or she has done more than the fact it's been done with a, a keyhole approach. Okay, thank you. And um, just so that the audience know, um, I probably misled people at the beginning. So the, the case study is real. This person really exists. I just wanted to reassure people that we didn't make it up. Uh, and now on that note, Declan, I wonder if you'd like to just speak about um, how you would respond to Peter when you got that referral from Jane. Yes, so Jane very nicely described uh, sort of three stages that, uh, that the GP gets involved with. One is in a patient who has not yet got a diagnosis but has perhaps a, an abnormal blood test and is concerned about the possibility of prostate cancer. Um, the second was the patient has been diagnosed and is, is going through treatment. And the third is the, the recovery, uh, the survivorship phase, supporting the patient. So I, I look at my role in a very similar fashion, actually. Um, I'm a urologist, as you know, and, uh, and my role at Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Melbourne, which is a very big um, cancer center, is it could be split into three similar uh, stages, actually. So in the first stage, when I see a patient like Peter, um, he's been referred in because um, Jane has uh, done a blood test, it's a bit abnormal, um, she's repeated it a couple of months later, perfectly reasonable thing to do, and has been sent in for um, a discussion about, am I at risk, what would we advise, should we do further investigations? So I spend a good chunk of my time dealing with patients like this, and, and, and we don't just automatically trigger a biopsy and go straight in there and, and do a test to see if the patient has cancer. So we take into account multiple factors, including the age of the patient, family history, genetic factors, like is there a BRCA2 mutation, for example, in the family. Yes, the PSA level, the blood test, is very important. And the behavior of the blood test, has it been going up over the years and all that. And then we'll often use um, uh, nomograms and other decision-related tools to, to ultimately advise the patient of uh, the, the, the options. And there are three things. I spend a lot of time doing this. Number one, just carry on keeping an eye on things. If we think the level of suspicion is quite low, it's reasonable just to keep observing uh, the patient. Number two, uh, consider a, an MRI scan. And, and uh, I can speak more about that, but using a scan has been a, a very popular um, a, a suggestion in the past three or four years as we recognize that MRI scanning can help um, uh, further define who needs a biopsy and who can be safely observed. And number three then, yes, ultimately doing a biopsy, and, and that's what we offer if we have a a significant degree of suspicion, uh, including, for example, an MRI scan being abnormal. But that whole process, the whole stage one thing of, should I have a biopsy, uh, should I um, uh, um, uh, have an MRI scan, et cetera, should I be worried, it is a complex one. And, and, and GPs like Jane spend a lot of time uh, talking through these, uh, these uh, options with patients. It's not like um, mammography or bowel cancer screening where there are clear uh, guidelines and decisions about Everybody should have a, a test, and then whoever's abnormal should be referred. Uh, prostate cancer early detection is, is, a, is a, a somewhat confusing area, and, and, and GPs spend a lot of time working these patients out, as do I when they come in the door. The second, stage two, as she called it, uh, is managing the patient who has a diagnosis. And the first thing I'll say here is that in the last 10 years, there's been a, a fundamental change in Australia. Uh, in the way in which we manage the newly diagnosed um, early prostate cancer. So it's confined to the prostate. Um, and rather than just go on and have surgery or radiation treatment, these being the, the mainstays of treatment, that we've now recognized there's a whole bunch of patients, um, uh, up to 60% uh, of, of select patients, who don't need treatment at all. They have a diagnosis of cancer, but they can be reassured, uh, and those patients um, uh, can be monitored rather than be treated. And, and I'm sure Jane and Samantha would agree that that, 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 that that certainly takes out a lot of the potential morbidity, psychological and, and physical um, in terms of treatment side effects. So, so we're big fans of surveillance as a strategy. But then the other patients who we've decided um, are not safe to observe, their cancer just looks a bit um, uh, um, threatening, will be offered treatment with either surgery or radiation therapy in the main. Um, and that's what I spend my time doing, uh, um, uh, taking out uh, uh, prostates in those patients who have uh, a significant-looking cancer who have opted uh, to have um, treatment. 
And then that final setting of um, uh, survivorship or recovery, and for me that also includes um, recurrence actually, or advanced cancer, cancers that are advanced uh, at the get-go, they're already into the bones or whatever, uh, is, is the other area of interest for me and, and indeed my team um, at Peter Mac in Melbourne have a, a very large amount of research programs in, in managing patients with uh, uh, advanced prostate cancer. So uh, I think, uh, as Jane pointed out, um, a multidisciplinary approach is terribly important in, in, in each of those three stages of the prostate cancer patient. And, and my simple message about this uh, is that the GP uh, has the most fundamental role because he or she is sort of the, the quarterback um, in this patient journey. Um, they're the trusted person who the GP often knows uh, him and his family for years and years. They're the one who's um, brought the patient towards the diagnosis of prostate cancer. They're the one who understands the social situation. They're the one who can um, refer in and out um, uh, with GP management care plans for psychology and physiotherapy, exercise physiology, etc. Uh, and they're the ones that, that raise the flags then when there are recurrences or severe depression, etc. throughout the journey. And, and so uh, that, that's my final message really is that I, I think that role of the GP in, in, this, in this very complex journey for a patient uh, is essential to act as a quarterback and, and dip in and out of urology and, and, and allied health and, uh, to try and improve uh, quality of life for these patients. Thanks very much, Declan. And I'm glad you, you did clarify there that the, the question of um, screening and early testing is very complex because there were some registration questions about why aren't we just screening everybody over the age of 45. And that's probably a topic for another complete webinar, but you acknowledge that it's a really um, complex area and it is something that GPs spend a lot of time discussing with their individual patients and it's really a case of shared decision making as I understand it. So thank you very much and um, just remembering that it's an MHPN webinar under the, um, the mental health um, treatment plan and the different professions that can be involved in providing um, focused psychological strategies counselling Obviously, we've got social workers, mental health OTs, as well as psychologists and clinical psychologists. And mental health nurses may also be in a position where they can provide that counselling too. In this case, Jane has referred um, Peter to see Samantha, who's a psychologist. And I'd like to invite you and Samantha to talk about how you would um, respond to Peter. Thanks. Okay, so um, initially I, I, I guess I want to cover what I think are some of the key ingredients for any mental health professional who's seeing Peter. Um, one is just having that basic knowledge of prostate cancer and the treatment effects um, associated with, with having surgery and understanding of what's normal adjustment for individuals, for men who've had prostate cancer surgery and dealing with those side effects um, as well as what's normal for couples and the willingness to work with the couple, not just the individual. That is not only more effective, it's more efficient in my experience. Um, ability to quickly foster a therapeutic alliance and importantly access to a multidisciplinary team for cross-referral. Okay, so um, I, I thought I would briefly cover, I guess, what is normal adjustment as well as uh, abnormal adjustment. So obviously after any cancer diagnosis, um, a man is going to experience really strong um, and often really unfamiliar and confusing emotions. Um, however, most men, unlike women diagnosed with breast cancer, will return to pretty normal levels of um, psychological functioning and life satisfaction and often despite persistent effects of treatment within weeks um, of the diagnosis or at least having made that treatment decision. But it's not uncommon for some men to experience distress that increases in the months following diagnosis. And understandably, that places relationships under great stress. So what are the risk factors for, um, for, for, for men who, who don't do so well? Um, well, younger age at the time of diagnosis. And for uh, a prostate cancer diagnosis, yeah, being aged under 50 is, is very young. Um, having persistent urinary and sexual side effects. Um, having a more traditional um, masculine identity, um, using avoidance as a way of coping and reduced expressions of love and intimacy, uh, particularly post-diagnosis. Um, post now, Peter has all of those. Um, so we can see actually just from looking at him, 
that he is at increased risk of perhaps not doing so well. Okay, so what I've done here is just visually represent, I guess, my understanding of what's going on because, you know, once you've done the assessment, I think it's helpful for you, but it's also helpful for, for Peter and Anne if you involve her as well, to see what you think is going on uh, to help inform your intervention and engage them importantly in the intervention. So um, we have Peter who's terrified of cancer um, and who um, not uncommonly appears to have a fairly traditional view of masculinity, being strong and capable and potent, who's dealing with the burden of incontinence, ongoing incontinence, um, or at least urinary symptoms and um, persistent erectile dysfunction. And his way of coping by trying to distance himself from reminders of this, especially his lack of potency, is preventing him from learning how to deal more effectively with the challenges and importantly, undermining his most important source of support and that's the support he gets from Anne. Um, so it's not surprising that he's now depressed. Okay, so we go on to perhaps what we could do with Peter and with Anne. So, you know, I'd, if I could engage the couple um, right up front um, or at least in a significant number of the sessions. So what I've done here is I've flagged what I think are the major issues on this in the next slide and then uh, what intervention I might use to, to address that issue. Um, I might uh, maybe move straight on to, um, you know, the depression. I think, you know, uh, Jane has dealt beautifully um, and and also if he's very fortunate to have, um, to have you know, such a, a, a skilled uh, urologist who's such a good communicator. Some of his fears have probably already been addressed um, that have been contributing to, to that initial avoidance. Um, so if we look at his depression, if it is really severe, we might need to look at some individual sessions to address that and or perhaps a referral on to a psychiatrist. But let's look at reasons why he's depressed. Um, I guess, you know, let's look at particularly um, his infidelity and the burden that that's placing on the relationship. I think, and my experience would be, he's probably, um, he's, he is probably engaging in telephone sex in an effort to perhaps increase his potency. Um, you know, he might have read and he might have been encouraged to use it or lose it as a way of um, improving his, um, his erectile function, but he's, you know, he's not um, prepared to um, to do that with Anne at, at risk of disappointing her and perhaps facing up to his own lack of masculinity. So he's trying elsewhere to see if he can he can address that. But of course, um, you know, that is devastating for Anne and so we do have to address Anne's hurt. We have to help her to understand where Peter's coming from and we have to help Peter to hear Anne's hurt and the reassurance she needs from him that she is a priority in his life. So let's look at the withdrawal from intimacy which has probably led to this situation um, anyway. So what I often find is that men do try to often protect their partners by not engaging in any physical intimacy, even in any uh, physical expressions of, of love uh, including any sort of form of touch because they're worried where that might lead. That might lead to their wife's expectation that they can have a sexual encounter and then if he can't have a firm erection, he's often worried that she won't uh, be satisfied um, with that. So let's look at that. Is that, is that underlying his, his withdrawal from intimacy? I suspect it is. And let's look at with Anne there talking about what, what is you know, what, what is her expectation? Will she be devastated if he can't get a firm erection? Um, and then look, look at um, perhaps looking at alternative ways to be intimate. Um, all right, then let's look at communication uh, and support because there's increased conflict in the relationship and each of them is feeling really isolated. I would normally get them to in session practice talking about how they're feeling and you might have to help Peter by summarising what you think he's feeling and then help each of the partners to really hear and convey an understanding and help them to schedule regular times to practise that skill um, as well as perhaps offering them some practical ways that they can support each other 
um, that might help to give them a little bit of momentum because they're really isolated at the moment. They're adding to each other's burden rather than giving each other support. Um, and I would also address um, perhaps getting in to um, getting, uh, um, unless they've already done this under Jane's encouragement, getting them into appropriate rehabilitation. Um, because what we find is men, you know, will often be quite prepared to listen and perhaps maybe experiment with alternative forms of intimacy. But having a, you know, a strong erection is often their first preference. So if we can make sure he is accessing um, some specialist penile re re rehabilitation strategies, let's address the barriers to doing that, making sure he's got access to that support, um, but also, you know, addressing any barriers he might have to accessing that continent um, support, um, you know, referring him on to the physiotherapist. You might be lucky enough to have access to a specialist prostate cancer nurse as well. Um, and you know, an exercise physiologist can often be um, wonderful because that's a really tangible way of increasing you know, masculine self-esteem at the very least. Um, so yes, that's I guess my input. Thanks very much, Samantha. And um, we will definitely come back to you. And so mm. now we're going to move on to um, having our panel discussion. Now I think I would like to bring Jane back in first of all. So there's been quite a few um, questions from the audience around uh, the, uh, to do with age. So oftentimes when someone's diagnosed with prostate cancer or even when you find an elevated PSA over the age of 70, people are may, may be advised um, not more likely perhaps to go for the watch and wait um, scenario or even if they prostate cancer is diagnosed, they may elect not to have treatment or may be advised to do that. So I just wonder whether you've had experience, Jane, of supporting older men who are aware that they might have a prostate cancer and not having treatment and whether that can that affects their mental health. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult issue. I mean, the once you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, um, it's unlikely to cause harm or death uh, for many years, it's a very long lead time that starts causing problems. So the ideal time is often in the younger man, sort of around 50s, 60s, um, but uh, it, when it comes to the older man in the 70s, you have to weigh up the question, do you test for prostate cancer, is number one, because uh, is the treatment going to be more harmful than not having any treatment, not knowing about it, so you have to weigh that up. Um, but if it's, if it's a very healthy 77-year-old uh, man who might live to 93 or 95 or and he's very independent and very robust and very active, well then uh, you have the discussion with them and you, and you may well test. And if you do find a cancer, then uh, you, he's, he's probably going to be more likely to have uh, radical treatment for that as opposed to uh, a, an older man who's very unwell, had strokes and... Uh, his, you know, his, his life, expectancy is not, life expectancy is not that long, um, then if you do detect a cancer, then you may not have radical treatment or suggest medical treatment, but you, you do watch and wait and you, you treat just so that uh, the symptoms, if the symptoms do occur, you worry about the symptoms as they pick up. So they don't try and cure it because it's more likely they'll, that person may pass away from something else before the cancer will get them. So it's a weighing up thing in the in the uh, older gentleman, um, and I'm sure Declan will be um, able to answer that a bit later, but uh, uh, those men who have been on the watch and wait, who haven't had the radical treatment, they tend to be very accepting of it, uh, I find. Um, and Jane, yeah. is, it sounds like, I mean, it's a lot of shared decision making, isn't it? Because there's not yeah. really clear cut answers, it always needs to be an individual you know, shared decision with the clinicians and their partner or lovers or whoever. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's the not. I mean, it prostate. No one wants prostate cancer, but it's, but um, a lot of prostate cancer will not cause symptoms for for a long time. But a lot of the treatment for prostate cancer will cause a lot of symptoms uh, sooner than the sooner than later. So you're weighing up uh, those sorts of questions when you're having a discussion with mm -hmm. the man and his partner. And are there some people that would have radiotherapy but not surgery? Yeah, and I, I uh, well, first of all, my understanding, and Declan may uh, may have some idea, but often you don't radiation therapy is not often uh, 
advisable in the younger patient because the radiation effects can last for many, 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 many years and, uh, uh, and can cause problems down the track. Whereas the older gentleman might not be a fit surgical candidate but may be very suitable for radiation therapy. And um, so it's often very helpful for a man to have uh, who's been diagnosed with prostate cancer to speak with a urologist and also to speak with a radiation therapist and get the two opinions because uh, um, they might not be a good candidate for one or the other treatment. Okay, thank you. So in in a minute we'll come back to Declan, but I just wanted to go um, to Samantha with another question related to age. I also want to acknowledge that not everyone's heterosexual and so there, I should mm -hmm. think that there are particular issues for same same-sex mm. attracted men, men in same-sex relationships, that mm. it may be even harder for them to raise some of some of the difficulties they're having um, mm. in in that situation. So I'm not you're welcome to comment on that, Samantha. But the, the particular question I wanted to ask you also was you mentioned that um, the psychological distress and adjustment is often harder for men in the mm. younger age group. I think you said before 50. Um, so is do you have some ideas about why it might be harder for that younger age group? I think it's because, you know, um, being potent and being sexually active in particular um, is such a, you know, a, a, a part of their life. Whereas for men in their 70s, you know, they might already be experiencing some level of erectile dysfunction um, and or, you know, sex or penetrative sex might not form such a a fundamental part of um, their, you know, their sex life with their partners, but also, you know, you know, men who are homosexual um, are more at risk, um, in my understanding of the literature, of experiencing distress, particularly if they're not in a, a committed relationship, um, and so you know that has to be taken into account. I know there are some specialist prostate cancer support groups uh, for gay men as well, and taking that into account is one of the issues they face. Okay, that's, I wasn't aware of that and I think that's mm -hmm. um, great to hear that there is that, that mm -hmm. support. Um, so I think we'll be coming back to Declan in a minute, but um, I might go back to Jane. So Jane, some questions have come in about recovery times. So Samantha's told us that um, a lot of men will psychologically adjust and be kind of um, settled and well again within a few months of the diagnosis. What about things like returning to work? Um, you know, how long's the recovery if someone does have to have a radical prostatectomy, whether, whether it's open or robotic? What, what sort of time frames are we looking at? Um, I, I think it's around the six weeks to a few months stage, depending on how they recover. Um, the continence, uh, most men are well conned by a year um, and uh, erectile function recovery depends on what the pre-morbid erectile function is like. If, if a man was having very good erectile function before surgery and it was a nerve sparing operation so the nerves weren't uh, going to be cut through at the time of the surgery, then there's a good chance that um, the man's erectile function will recover. It will be different, sex life will be different for him after after surgery, the penis is shorter, um, and uh, uh, and uh, orgasm is dry. Um, so it's a different sex life, but it is possible. Um, uh, but if a man, if a, if a man before surgery is having some erectile difficulties for whatever reason, uh, and then you uh, upset the whole erectile function with the surgery, uh, he may take a long time to recover erectile function. Um, if ever, he may not recover it. Um, the important thing about the penile rehabilitation is uh, is the discussion about is, is is the man to start a tablet like Viagra or one of those PD-5 inhibitors before surgery, low dose, just to maintain re and erections, have the surgery, once the catheter's out, go back on the medication to keep, to keep the blood flowing into the penis to maintain mm -hmm. that um, erectile ability. Um, even if it's not for sex, just for purely to have erections, um, get the blood in there. So that when uh, uh, they already have sex, then there's erections are possible. But if a, if this is not looked after and then and erections aren't happening for a long time, fibrosis can occur and erectile function may never occur just occur because of that. Um, thank you for that. Um, and 
do you see, I mean, because you're a GP, so you're dealing with people who have all different kinds of um, cancer. Do you think that, um, you know, are the effects of prostate cancer significantly different from other kinds of cancer in men? Um, I think erect, I think prostate cancer is significant because it, it does affect the erectile function and the continence. And, and often these men have got no symptoms. Um, they're feeling well, they may, may never have had any other illnesses or problems in the past. Then someone tells them they've got cancer, they don't feel like they have it, they're told they have it, and then they go through this surgery and hospital where there's, um, and then it really affects a very important part of being a man. It's just, just A, getting erections, B, having sex, um, and also the continent side. So it, it really does uh, psychologically have greater effect, impact, I believe, compared to other cancers. Okay, thank you. And Samantha? Just coming back to you, um, I mean the other person that's really prominent in this case in this case study is Peter's partner, um, mm -hmm. and I guess I might ask you the same question. Um, so, you know, um, partners who are having to support their their men through different kinds of cancer, have you noticed that prostate cancer also has a a particular um, challenge of its own um, for partners? Um, yeah, we often find that partners experience as much as not more distress um, than the man uh, initially. Um, and then over time their distress about the cancer tends to settle down, I guess, as, you know, as soon as they know that their partner is not going to die from their cancer. And often men with prostate cancer early stage, you know, they're going to live for a very long time, if not forever. <laughs> um, but oftentimes women's distress will and relationship dissatisfaction will increase. So the man's distress might start to improve, um, and but the women's distress, um, if if there is that relationship dissatisfaction occurring, and the man is withdrawing as a way of coping um, with his impaired um, potency, then often women's relationship dissatisfaction um, will increase, even though they're not as distressed by the cancer anymore. They're often, you know, quite. Mm, you're know, quite aware that the relationship is not what it was and, and sometimes very um, upset about that. Okay. And Jane, um, what are, what's your thoughts around the distress for partners with prostate cancer? Um, usually they're, 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 often there's a lot of support in the partners but and they, they go through the natural worry and anxiety but some consultations I've had where uh, I've had to Worry solely about the, the wife. Uh, you know, the, the guy's got the cancer. He's coping okay, but she's distressed. She's grieving the man. He's uh, she's lost. Um, you know, not lost, but what her concept of a husband is now. He's now a cancer man. That's how she sees it. Um, uh, it they can be quite loss of sex, loss of intimacy. Um, I, I think in these cases there were probably issues in the relationship before it happened, but uh, sometimes you spend a lot of time just. Uh, uh, counselling uh, the partner. Okay, thank you. And I guess that's where it's important having having the, the GP in the role of knowing the whole family, and certainly the allied health professional and the urologist are probably including partners in the discussions as well. Um, now, just to remind the audience that the please try and keep the discussion to pro, to professional. Many many of our topics in MHPN. Um, are things where people who are both health professionals and have had their own personal experience. Um, just remembering that not everybody has and so we're trying to make this as useful as we can for professionals who don't have special expertise. Um, yeah, and I think Declan, we have you back and I just wanted to ask you, we were talking before and we needed your expert advice just around um, uh, radiotherapy and surgery. So I think Jane was saying that um, perhaps in perhaps more often in older people there might be a decision. Men might choose to have some radiotherapy, but but not surgery. Um, and we were sort of emphasising the importance of in all of these things how it's really shared decision. And I, and I noticed that um, you know people need to talk to the GP, the urologist, maybe the radiation specialist, and get a lot of information before making decisions. Is that been your experience as well, that people really need to be informed and to make their own unique decisions? 
Uh, yes, for sure. And um, uh, I can tell you that uh, one of the most important underlying principles of management of early prostate cancer is to seek a multidisciplinary approach. So uh, whether that is um, uh, uh, reaching out to radiation oncologists, surgeons, uh, et cetera, or indeed going into a decision tree uh, aids with um, the support of GP, allied health, et cetera, it's very, very important that patients feel well supported in the decision they make. And prostate cancer is a little bit uh, challenging like that for patients because um, in the first instance, um, it's not like you've just turned up with an obstructing bowel cancer and you, and you must have surgery. The, the, you know, the, there's a very clear path in front of you. With early prostate cancer, you truly often have options, including surgery, radiation, or, or in, in, in some early instances, just observation. So I think, therefore, it makes perfect sense to have a multidisciplinary um, approach. Uh, and certainly, you know, the majority of our patients at, at Peter McCallum Cancer Center are second opinions. They've been diagnosed elsewhere. But even those patients we diagnose ourselves, we, we, we pretty much insist that they get exposed to a, a number of people to help them uh, reach a decision. And I guess that also, it normalizes it, doesn't it? So if, if you're just explaining this is our normal practice, that we like you to see all these different people, then uh, it's just normal that that's what you do. So perhaps people that maybe have not been used to kind of, you know, sharing their stuff with different health professionals and maybe haven't traditionally gone to the doctor very much, it, I presumably that then that helps them to access all those things which they might otherwise be a bit shy about. I'm just guessing that. Well, I think you said it uh, very well, actually. It, it, it's quite normal. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, I think... Um, Sometimes patients feel they're sort of cheating on their specialist if they if they ask for a second opinion, you know, and uh, and are they ask questions like, oh, how many of these operations have you done? Because they've they've read on a blog or in a support group that you know you should actually ask your specialist what their experience is of, of surgery or of delivering radiation. But you know, that's per these are perfectly reasonable steps to take uh, as as you try and reach a decision about your treatment that you feel confident in. And so multidisciplinary, you know, approaches, you know, asking direct questions, doing Google searches, you know, these, these are things that uh, people should feel comfortable um, uh, doing. Um, and, and one of the, one of the um, challenges I suppose we have is that although our, um, our um, listeners tonight are uh, experts all over the country, um, uh, patients often don't readily have access to uh, mental health professionals and, uh, or indeed um, a regular GP sometimes. Um, at Peter Mac, we've, we've published a number of um, uh, online interventions about psychological aspects of prostate cancer over the years, um, including uh, an online intervention called My Road Ahead, uh, led by one of our uh, psychologists at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, uh, Addie Wooten. And, and she had a very big grant and made a, a very nice online intervention, which was a journey, like a road navigation, where patients could dip in and out of specialist nurses, um, psychologists, uh, GPs, etc. Um, to, to, to determine if we improve their, uh, their satisfaction on their prostate cancer journey compared to standard treatment. And yes, you know, we published this data in European Neurology and more recently in Psycho-Oncology showing that those patients who access the online intervention uh, had better outcomes, better quality of life. So I think that's very important. We, we just don't have um, uh, enough um, uh, a resource around the country to make these things physically available to people, but we must make efforts to have interventions online or decision aids online to, to help the patients access their support. I'm, I'm glad you said, I think you read my mind, Declan, because I was just thinking about people in, you know, rural and remote areas. So that I, the, the multidisciplinary team at the Peter Mac sounds like um, where we'd all want to go. Uh, Australia is an enormous country and um, it's great to hear that some of those resources are available online. Um, Samantha, have you had any experience with, um, you know, rural and remote clients and also supporting rural and remote professionals? Um, certainly I've had experience delivering telephone and Skype interventions to people in rural and remote areas, and including telephone group interventions. And I've, I've found that they work equally as effectively delivering them over the telephone. Um, the, the good thing um, that's recently come in in terms of the better access, the mental, um, mental health care plan is now um, available to use over the telephone for people in certain rural and remote areas who couldn't have 
um, obtained that rebate prior to a couple of months ago because uh, they had to see uh, the psychologist face to face. Um, so that's a way of increasing access for men and their partners, particularly in rural and remote areas who, who are significantly distressed or anxious. And Samantha, this is another, I, I mean, it's probably Declan and Jane as well, but I'm going to ask you, you know, a lot of um, health professionals, counselling professionals, mental health clinicians may not have had personal or family experience of cancer. Mm. So how do we, um, you know, understand the experience of, of the person and their partner? How can we empathise with people having something as confronting as cancer? Mm. I think most people have had some exposure to someone who's, who's been diagnosed with a life-threatening illness um, and you know, so often you can connect with how that felt or how, how you thought that person might have felt. Um, so, you know, and, and or if you haven't with a life-threatening illness, then any, any trauma because it really is. The adjustment to a cancer diagnosis is like the adjustment to any trauma. Um, you know, whether that be you know, being exposed to a hold-up or in a car accident, there's often that sort of sequelae of, of thoughts and feelings and um, you know, feeling really distressed often and like you're going crazy to start with. And as psychologists or mental health professionals who are sort of intervening with someone really close to a diagnosis, often just normalising that, you know, that's, you know, that's actually quite normal to experience those symptoms can be incredibly powerful as an intervention because it's often their anxiety about being anxious or, or feeling that they're not coping that's a big contributor to their distress. Okay, thanks Samantha. Um, Jane, I just wanted to come back to you with a couple of questions. People in the audience are wondering um, why GPs don't do um, a rectal examination for prostate uh, as much as we used to. So it used to be kind of an expected thing that as you got older as a man that that was one of the preventive activities in general practice was that your GP would do a rectal exam to check your prostate. Now that's not done so much anymore. Do you, do you know why that is? <laughs> well, I think over years there have been lots of different guidelines from lots of different uh, areas uh, um, giving us advice as to how to screen for prostate cancer. Uh, when I started, as always, did the PSA and do a rectal examination. Uh, then, uh, for a while, uh, there was a concern about the amount of overdiagnosis of prostate cancer and the overtreatment and the more harm than benefits. So, the, our College of General Practitioners suggested uh, don't even screen, don't don't even counsel them, and don't, don't you know, advise against testing for prostate cancer. Um, and that wasn't in line with other. Uh, colleges and um, specialty um, guidelines. So it's it's evolved with time. So GPs sort of were doing them, and then we weren't doing it, and then we were told only to do it if uh, uh, you know if a man requested to be tested or counselled only if he asks about it. So in 2017, all the colleges got together and produced a set of guidelines, um, and they're all uh, they all uh, was giving out that same message. And the, the bottom line was in the in the primary practice is to do the PSA test um, and not to do a rectal examination. I, I think possibly uh, I'm, I'm not sh really sure why we're told not to do it, but um, I know some GPs still do it. Uh, but the the guideline is in primary care not to do the, the rectal examination, but to refer at a lower level of the PSA test so that um, and then. Uh, when they're referred on to urologists, that's when the rectal examination would be done. Okay. So it's still quite controversial. A lot of GPs still do it, but uh, the guidelines are suggesting not to. I'm really relieved to hear that the colleges all got together and came up with the same guidelines because it sounds yes. as though the profession was confused themselves, which must have made it very confusing <laughs> for the patient. Yeah. Um, so, Declan, I'd like to come back to you on that. So, just do you have any comments around, um, you know, prostate examination? I presume that is probably part of your practice. Yes, it is, and um, you know, unfortunately, trying to reach a, a consensus uh, on a reasonably confusing and contentious issue like this means that, you know, you have to dilute things down, and not everyone agrees. So, I don't agree with the uh, 
that recommendation. It was quite controversial, actually, when it came out that uh, we shouldn't offer that. Um, and at the moment, I'm just revising uh, some text for Cancer Council uh, Australia on a, on, a, on a care pathway they're just proposing. And we refer in the Cancer Council guidelines to this uh, quite straight straight up recommendation not to do a rectal examination. And, uh, and I, I think it does add value. I don't think it's essential. I think if a man says, look, I'm interested enough to come and have a chat with you about my, my early prostate cancer risk, my brother's just been diagnosed, or my, uh, I've just realized three of my uncles died, so, um, but uh, however, I'm not having one of those rectal exams, that's okay, that, that's fine. In fact, data from the screening studies in Europe uh, showed that um, uh, uh, a, a, you know, there was still value in just having a PSA test. I just think there's added value in having a rectal examination as well. Uh, in my own career, I was sticking fingers up uh, bottoms to examine prostates. I've diagnosed three rectal cancers, uh, for example. And um, uh, I think just as a physician approach to someone uh, in terms of pelvic health, um, it, it's hard enough to get a bloke in the door of your practice uh, in their 50s and 60s. And, 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 and I think um, uh, well, I do routinely offer it, and I think it's a reasonable recommendation. OK. And I've got another question for you um, regarding um, I mean, it's maybe hard to give a, a figure, but people are sort of wondering what um, proportion of people would go back to having a, a sex life that they're content with. So Sam's already told us that it's going to be different, but what, what proportion of um, men in, in your practice do you think end up having a sexual life after prostatectomy that is satisfying to them and their sexual partners? Yeah, so your first, the first way you phrased that, Mary, was what proportion men go back to having a, a normal sex life, and that, that's not percent. Um, uh, quite simply because the impact of treatment for prostate cancer on, on prostate function is very profound. If you have a prostatectomy, for example, you no longer ejaculate. Um, so that, that's a fundamental big change from normality. Um, so we explain that to patients, and if, for example, having more children, um, is an issue, and now these are usually older men, typically in their 60s, um, but you never know. You know, I've been caught short on that once before when the 30-year younger wife uh, comes in the door and they say, yes, no, we're definitely having six more children, um, uh, but, but that's an issue. So, but men don't ejaculate. But our holy grail, if you like, for sexual recovery, what we would love our men to be able to achieve is uh, rigidity uh, and orgasm. And following on from that, you think, okay, that means satisfaction. But let me tell you that achieving rigidity, rigidity um, and orgasm, rigidity for penetration is extremely difficult. And the minority of men, in my experience, undergoing this type of surgery will be able to achieve rigidity penetration um, uh, in the five years after prostatectomy. So this is the, the most important part of counseling patients uh, for surgery, uh, in my view. We have to be very honest and say, um, we expect you're going to have a good cancer outcome. We expect you'll have a very good continence outcome. However, we expect there will be a profound impact on your ability to have uh, what you may regard as, as uh, normal sex, no ejaculation, and, it, and also rigidity may be very, very difficult to achieve. And if we set uh, reasonable expectations for our patients in that regard, the, the further question about satisfaction in sexual activity is, is ameliorated. It's quite different. If you say to a couple that um, uh, um, Peter is very unlikely to be able to achieve rigidity for penetrative sex, et cetera, and won't be uh, ejaculating, and that's already important that they understand that because it, not all patients uh, have that explanation and have that expectation. Uh, and then if we work very hard with our patients uh, uh, with the support of our allied health professionals, uh, which in my practice includes uh, an intimacy consultant who's a specialist in orgasm and, and pleasure, so strategies around that, not just penetrative uh, re restoration, then, you know, patients can be satisfied. If their expectation is no rigidity and they achieve some rigidity or they achieve a, a re-navigation of their sexual uh, lives, such that um, there's less, less rigidity in penetration, but perhaps more focus on toys, games, lubricants, etc. you know, pleasure and quality of life may, may still be um, achievable. So my key message there is it's very different afterwards. And we have to set very realistic expectations for our patients so that they're not ultimately very dissatisfied because their expectations haven't been reached. Thanks for that. And I, look, it's great to be able to have like the, the nuts and bolts details of these sort of questions because um, these are often conversations that are hard to have. Um, Samantha, I'm just going to come back to you now. 
So I will ask you to give us your final key messages because as always we're running out, we're having a great discussion and time is coming to an end. But I just mm. wondered if you've got any particular um, tips that, um, or st what, what strategies have you found are effective with men? So we mentioned mindfulness at the beginning, that doesn't mm -hmm. fit um, all men Everyone, by any means. No. Well, what are the things that, that tend to resonate with men in your experience? Okay, my, in, my, in my experience it's um, normalising his experience so he doesn't feel like a freak and that he's somehow different to other men. Um, and because men don't often speak to other men, they often don't know that. So normalising it, um, you know, validating um, and particularly working with the couple to help them to understand how each of them is feeling um, and why they are reacting the way they're reacting to clear up those misunderstandings and then enhancing or getting that communication working, getting that back on board and exploring uh, different ways of being close and connected that don't involve necessarily you know, uh, a firm erection um, and working with each other to explore you know, what that would look like and how they might achieve that um, is very powerful. Thanks, Sam. And is there any other things that you just wanted to leave the audience with as we wrap up this evening? Um, I guess, you know, most men and their partners do well after a diagnosis, despite ongoing um, difficulties with potency. Um, so, you know, it's not doesn't mean you're not going to cope just because you've had a diagnosis, but um, it is it isn't an easy path to travel and you do need to work on um, particularly the relationship to ensure that you know you're supporting each other uh, through this rather than working alone and potentially then increasing each other's distress. Thanks so much Sam and uh, I'd like to now invite Jane back in just to um, give us any final comments that you'd like to have and I just wanted to observe like um, I think the more comfortable that any practitioner is whether it's GPs, urologists, um, allied health counsellors, psychologists, that we are to be able to talk about sex, sexual function, um, sexual behaviour, sexual practices, it's going to help our patients feel more comfortable. So the urologist is talking about things like lubricant and toys and there's lots of couples in Australia that wouldn't normally have those conversations. So I, I guess I'm just observing it's, it's great to have the example of practitioners who can just comfortably have those conversations. Um, so you can comment on that, but also if there's um, some final things that you'd like to to say. Well, on that note, uh, it's, it's and with all the other allied health, it's your resources and your local referral network is so important to know who you're referring to. I mean, as Declan mentioned the, mentioned the intimacy counsellor, I, I have certainly referred to her and she's fantastic. And so it's always lovely to know confidence in, the, in these uh, the skills of the allied health people you refer to. Um, it is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, team requirement. Um, the role of the GP is to hang in there with Peter, go on the journey with him and uh, coordinate his care and try and uh, maintain hope and, and as good a quality of life as possible for him. Thanks Jane. Uh, and Declan, I'd like to invite you back in to um, give us your final comments. Thanks. Yes, Mary, because you, you made a very fair point about the discussion around uh, toys and lubricants is something that not all patients are comfortable with. But part of my real role is making people feel comfortable talking about this. So the average age of my, my, my patients is 61 or thereabouts. So the couple's in their early 60s sitting in front of me. And I have to address straight up front uh, uh, before uh, we discuss treatment. Do you mind me asking, uh, do you still enjoy reasonable erections of the penis? Or uh, can you tell me a little bit about what you two enjoy together? And in many instances, this is a conversation that's never happened um, between a couple. Okay, and but it, it, it's very important. It's cathartic because it's a big change for the couple, or and certainly the man afterwards. And then we've set the we've set the goalposts. We're going to be talking about this on a, on a Monday morning in in my office. Uh, and um, and then when we come back afterwards, and I talk about the role of uh, an intimacy specialist, uh, the way I say it is, you know, she likes to see you as a couple for one hour. Her focus is on pleasure, intimacy, etc. In other words, it's away from rigidity and penetration, which men and, and surgeons are kind of obsessed with. We think we want to get the erections back, but in actual fact, what couples want is to get the pleasure back and get the quality of life. 
And I can tell you uh, in, in, in final that um, uh, the amount of patients in their 60s who come back to me and say, that consultation was fantastic. I wish we met her in her 40s, um, you know, when, uh, when, when uh, we could have done with a bit of a boost, et cetera, you know. So I, I think refocusing, re-navigation away from rigidity and penetration, which is very, very difficult, I'm afraid to say after this, onto pleasure orgasm, you know, without rigidity and penetration uh, is a very important, uh, um, I suppose, evolution of my view on, on that part of survivorship. Uh, I was actually just thinking the same thing. I was imagining there would be lots of couples who'd come back and say, I wish we'd done that 20 or 30 years ago. So it's great to hear. So thank you all so much for a really um, interesting discussion and thanks to our audience tonight. Um, so we're just about at the end of our evening. So I'd like to just make sure that everyone um, completes the feedback survey before you log out. So there'll be a feedback survey tab that you can just log on. We really do want your feedback and uh, we listen to it. And if there is any other topics that you think you would like covered, you're really welcome to, um, to ask for that. Uh, in the resources, and I know Declan mentioned the resources from Peter McCallum um, and, and other things that the panellists um, have recommended are in the resources box. Um, the webinar will be available to, re to view again or to recommend for other people online uh, as are all the uh, MHPN webinars in the library. Uh, certificates of attendance will be issued within four weeks based on your registration and your login uh, and you will also be sent a link to the online resources. So um, we also would like to invite you to continue attending MHPN webinars. Uh, you will get sent notifications. And we also support the engagement and ongoing maintenance of professional uh, practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet around um, specific topics or local areas to share tips and resources, build local referral pathways and engage in CPD activities together. Um, some of those networks are online, many of them are local. So to learn more about joining your local practitioner network, contact the MHPN or go to the news section of the website. Um, and you could also put your interest in the uh, exit survey if you would like to. Um, and before I close, I'd also like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. And also on this occasion, given that our topic is prostate cancer, to acknowledge um, the men and women whose lives have been affected by prostate cancer. So thank you everyone for your participation this evening and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Good night. <laughs>